What you're about to hear is from a series I do on Patreon, which I call Story Time with Jack. Uh, this this will be the 23rd episode of it. I read old books. So I, well, I read one old book and I'm moving on to some others, which you'll hear at the end of the episode what I've got planned. Uh, and if you join the Patreon, you'll be able to hear all the others, obviously. But you, you enjoy this. It's free for you to give it a go. Uh, see if you want to listen to this. I, I, I read it and then make up bits as well and add little bits in and just fucking it's just nice in it to read a book and some of you say oh, i just want to listen to you read a book or stuff like that so here you go just uh, have it enjoy me reading and struggling to read this fucking blurry paged chapter 23 of the world's strangest crimes by c.e main it's a book from the 1960s but here you go you all right it's time for chapter 23 the world's strangest crimes and we have not many left we're on page 191 there's goes to page 231 and then it just ends dead so not long 40 pages i don't know if this is the last one no there's at least another so the picture is a woman dead with a piano behind her uh broken stool a chair fancy chair fireplace she's on some form of shag pile rug it looks like like bear skin rug kind of thing, you know, like long hair though, so a long furred bear. Um, Fantasia fantasy makes me think that it's going to be something to do with music, magic, cleaning, um, maybe Mickey Mouse, or maybe, right, maybe it's going to be some weird sort of death on a steamboat, and that's going to lead to this woman owning one of the largest brainwashing franchises in the world, maybe. Some criminal cases resemble an iceberg, uh, some some it starts immediately starts in an annoying way, innit? That's just a stupid thing to say. Uh, immediately you get the idea he's going for his word count, though, from that sentence. Some criminal cases, but in, in comparison to what other ones have we got? The other starting sentences. Have we got what? Just the last one. What was the last starting sentence? At about six o'clock in the morning. Straight to it. Facts. This one. Bit in the air. <coughs> Some criminal cases resemble an iceberg in that the greater part remains beneath the surface deep, and is never revealed to the public eye, particularly if there is a hint of scandal. uh, Speaking of icebergs, just before we get right into this, I I quite like a romaine lettuce myself, but I'm always worried about buying one because I don't know how to pronounce it, and I don't really want to be going around saying I'd like a Romany lettuce, please, just in case that's offensive to people. Do you know what I mean? I I don't know if you worry about that. Uh, beneath the service, it is never revealed to the public eye, particularly if there is a hint of scandal involving the, quote, establishment, the big they, ladies and gentlemen, our author, who has remained nameless, really, C.E. Main, is a conspiracy theorist, he's one of us. The case is tried and disposed of on a superficial level, even though the police and press suspect or even know that there is a great deal more behind the scenes which cannot be disclosed. Of course, when scandal is involved, the individual's concern may not necessarily have committed an offence in law, and an exposure can only be justified if it is in the public interest to do so, subject to pressures applied in the interests of national security, politics and sometimes national morality. A typical case of this kind occurred in Italy just after the end of the Second World War. At that time, there had been a wave of murders in Rome which had baffled the police. In the late afternoon of the 21st of June 1945, the Rome police received a telephone call from a young woman who said that she was very concerned about the safety of a girlfriend named Maria Laffey, who lived in the apartment below. Nothing very dramatic had happened. She had called Maria during that same afternoon and said, I uh, don't really know what's going on, but I think something's going to happen to me, and if you, you could do something about it, please, and maybe inform the police in <laughs> about five hours' time, that would be great, because <laughs> I don't really remember how I got home, and I don't know if I am at home, and I think I'm ringing you off my house, for, <laughs> but but it might be that fella's house that I kind of met that said his name was, uh, I think, Jensik, and <laughs> I think he must have been, like, Eastern European, he, 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 from the Soviet Union, and um, he says that he can do magic and that, he gets about wearing a cloak. But when she rang the bell and then knocked, there was no reply, even though Maria had been expecting her. That in itself was unusual, but not necessarily sinister. However, during the morning, he had heard strange sounds in Maria's flat, and adding the two incidents together, she now felt uneasy. 
It's quite well written so far, this one for him, innit? The police arrived a few minutes later. The door to the flat was still locked and no key was readily available, so they broke in by force. They found Maria Laffey lying face down in a blood-soaked carpet close to a grand piano. Imagine fucking having to wing that upstairs. And onto a sheet music copy of Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata on the music ledge. Uh, hopefully that's going to be called back to later. Maria was a pretty blonde girl, petite and of slight build, hefty tits, and was wearing only a thin summer dress that when the light shone through with the blood stains, you could see straight through it. And with no underclothes of any kind. What do we reckon? Do we reckon? Do we reckon um, one of them? So I don't know what the call. I don't know what the nef- the names really are for different types of vaginas. There must be names for them. There's got to be names for like the flappy ones, and there's got to be names for them sort of tucked in ones. We could make up names for them. Has she got? Has she got a ham sandwich or a clam? Let me know in the comments below. This dead lady in 1945. <laughs> For she was no this was a professional uniform, for she was known to operate in the higher echelons of the call girl business. And she was also the mistress of Count Seretani, whenever he happened to be in Rome. Consequently, she was well established and her apartment was in the luxury category. The police made a meticulous search of the flat and underneath her summer dress, and eventually found the murder weapon in the bathroom. It was a hunting knife, but it had been carefully washed to remove all traces of blood. Not a single fingerprint was found on the handle or the blade. It was identified as the murder weapon because the shape of the incisions on the body of Maria corresponded with the shape of the blade. That was a really well-written sentence, like for the, the syllables. Very nice to read. As in the case of the previous murders in the recent spate of crime, the police made little apparent progress. She went through the obvious routine, uh, sorry, they went through the obvious routine of investigation, not the neighbours not investigating it, the first line of inquiry was into Maria's male clientele, and among them was a certain Signor Alfio Fantasia, an antique dealer who was already known to the police for other reasons. For instance, he was travelling around America collecting antiques off of shelves, shoving them up his arsehole whilst wearing a kilt, and popping them back onto the shelf. His antique, that's a real man that I've read about in a magazine, by the way, who's been doing that. Well worth looking into. Maybe maybe I should start just talking about that magazine in shows on here. Um, uh, for instance, his antique shop was already a cover for a gambling saloon at the rear. In addition, Fantasia was on record in the police files as a failed gunman from southern Italy, suspected of having connections with the Mafia. Inevitably, Signor Fantasia was required to answer a number of, and then we've got a pause in all of this for uh, lots of photographs. So, oh, I've got pictures of Gaston from the, uh, I think that was from the boat one, wasn't it? Um, maybe. The, the, oh, no, Gaston was the um, special needs family, wasn't it, who had killed people in the farm because he wanted to watch the woman get dressed or something, and then he beat them all to death and clubbed the little girl. The other one here. Brian Donald Hume got away with murder in 1950, but was imprisoned as an accessory for dropping the dismembered remains of Stanley Setti's body from a small aeroplane. Oh, that's what he looked like then. Quite a high forehead. Receding hairline. Uh, also receding from the centre, the side part in as well. There's a picture of a weird flat. It doesn't tell you whose flat that is. Uh, and then on the other side, we just got... I don't even know what that would be, if, how to describe that photograph. Like, maybe 15 people standing round in a crowd. No description as to what these are. These are terrible pictures. Uh, below is the Dominici farm. Ah, that's the farm where it happened. No, terrible timing for them photographs. Let's carry on. Where was we? I'll read this last sentence uh, again. Inevitably, Senior Fantasia was required to answer a number of rather pointed questions. But when the police called, he was not at home. A man on operation was set up and he was quickly traced to an hospital into which he had successfully contrived to gain admission during the murder hunt. He was to have an operation for piles. Maybe that's why they've included the shag pile rug. But Fantasia's ingenuity failed him when the police duly arrived at his bedside. They asked questions and he, in alarm and self-defence, gave that were... Gave that what were... Gave that what were... Probably truthful answers. They asked him questions. They asked questions, and he, in alarm and self-defence, gave that what were probably truthful answers. Okay, that the, that isn't needed at all. 
gave what were probably truthful answers, at least to the extent that they resulted in the arrest and imprisonment of three young men. And at the point, a simple murder case, what? And at the point, a simple murder case centred on a better class prostitute began to assume submerged iceberg depths. And he's fell off the fucking cliff again, the writer. He was fine in that first couple pages. The Italian newspapers took up the story in a big way. And the chronicle of the crime and its subsequent investigation and ramifications in principality that presented by the press who began to sense a hidden sensational scandal which was slowly emerging from an examination of the backgrounds of the three young men who had been in prison. That's a fucking hell of a sentence, mate. That, that's an entire paragraph, that sentence. Not a single full stop in the fucker. But dashes and loads of commas. There seems little doubt in retrospect that behind the superficial story lay a much more complex tale of political intrigue, which, if not, was known to the police. Why, God, which, if not, was known to the police. And then in brackets, and there seems little reason to suppose not, as he just typed not twice, that it was carefully suppressed. This is a terrible... It's, it's like he starts drinking through the right in each chapter or something. He just loses interest. It should be remembered that at this time, just after the war, Italy was in a chaotic state in the cross-currents of post-fascist politics. There was the cloak-and-dagger atmosphere of recrimination and high-level wire-pulling, the jockeying for position. And here we go, we've got the leader now coming in the second place and he's taking on the first hurdle and then he's going, and he's going, and he's, and he's took on Mussolini. Mussolini is down, ladies and gentlemen. The Mafia have gonna take it. Johnny Big Lips has took first place. Seeing as it's a little bonus episode, I thought I'd include a little discount code. So the discount code, all capital letters, Ducky Style. I've put it in the comments in the description below. And what you can do is you can use it to get one of my magnets for £1.50 cheaper, right? It's of a duckling's head uh, on a little bikini woman. And she's bending over with her arse right up in the air, mate. So if you want to get that for... One pound fifty less. Go and use the discount code Ducky Style. D U C K Y S T Y L E. I'll put it below so you remember. Also, remember that you've got the discount codes for Fat Pete's Prince, which is Dead Rats. I'll put that in the description below as well. I haven't got any other discount codes for you, but there is a seven-day free trial on my Patreon, and for about fucking maybe six more hours today, when this goes out. You can join me OnlyFans for $3.75, so if you fancy giving that a go, where you can watch possibly erotic, possibly funny videos, over 700 of them of me talking about me stock, and the uh, every week I do a live stream from under the desk, whilst I try and sell stuff on a, a live stream above the desk, where you just it's basically see me in my boxes. But you're probably not into that, but just so you know, if you are... There's a little discount on there as well. This is a bonus episode, isn't it? So I've got to... Normally I would charge people to listen to this on my Patreon. So I've got to get a couple of things in here, haven't I? A little adverts in that. Speaking of adverts, please listen to this one as well. Which was seen in France after the liberation and later in Germany after the unconditional surrender. In such an environment, an apparently straightforward murder could well be a cover for something much more devious. The Fantasia case, as reported in the Italian press, was crystallising into what seemed to be a conventional pattern for that particular era. Fantasia turned out to be something of a wide boy. In addition to running his antiques and gambling saloon business, he was involved in the black market, which makes sense if he's doing antiques, I suppose, and already doing illegal gambling, and had also been making money by extortion and fraud. A friend of his, a friend of ours, has named Alberto Galpi Galupi, Alberto Galupi, or Gallopi, it's very horse-like, isn't it? It adds to the analogy earlier. Put to him a scheme, a little scheme, whereby he could extract protection money from a Signor Rossi, who's, or Signora Rossi, sorry, who's as, uh, absent, husband, was being sought by the police. Now all the writing's blurry me, like I'm fucking having a migraine was being sought by the police on a charge of being a former agent of OVRA, O-V-R-A, the Women's Fascist Secret Front, OVRA, OVRA. The Fascist Secret, I've got Fascist, right? The Fascist Secret Police and Secret Police Organisation, Signora Rossi, terrified as to her husband's fate, paid over the blackmail money. The accusation proved to be totally untrue. 
Signor Rossi had never had any connection with Ovra, and when he eventually came home to Rome, he made a point of seeking out Fantasia and threatening to denounce him to the police unless he immediately returned the money. The answer to the obvious question, why Rossi didn't go straight to the police as soon as he learnt of the blackmail, is that he wanted first and foremost to recover the money, which amounted to one million lira. Since it was virtually impossible to recover money from a convicted and imprisoned blackmailer, he used Fantasia's own weapon, threat and coercion. Fantasia could not return the money because he'd spent it, and his urgent problem was to find another source of supply, and he knew that Rossi could send him to jail without any difficulty, but that Rossi would rather have his million lira, lira back in the, pl- in the price of Fantasia's liberty. Fantasia could see the point. His freedom was worth more than a million spent lira. Lira, sorry. I'm not doing that as a bit, I, it's because it's spelled L-I-R-E, and then I remember, oh no, it's, it was said Lyra. I always thought it would be spelled L-E-R-A. The only trouble was that money of that kind was in short supply. Being a regular client of Ma- Maria Laffey, Fantasia knew from his frequent visits to her flat that she possessed a well-stocked jewel case. Most of the contents had been provided by Count Serenati, Seratini, Seratani, her principal admirer. Oh. The jewels could serve his problem, could solve his problem, sorry, that was me. But he was not prepared to steal them himself. The text on this is so blurry. Instead, he put, like, the, some of the letters are just mashed together. Instead, he put the proposition to Alberto Galupi, the friend, yeah, the, that friend of ours, for this thing of ours, who had involved him in the Signora Rossi extortion, which was the direct cause of his present dilemma, Alberto rather reluctantly, and now we've printed it properly, appreciated the justice of the arrangement, one good crime deserves another, and agreed to relive, relieve Maria, sorry, of her jewels, which, after all, we've all gone blurry again, were merely the wages of sin. But Alberto had no intention of doing the job himself, and here the first element of fantasy begins to enter the plot. He decided to use two accomplices. Renato Piacenti, a 22-year-old undergraduate, and Luigi Tyrone, a 25-year-old army officer. This was indeed a strange liaison. Both young men came from good families, and the fathers were respectively a senior civil servant and a colonel. Luigi, the officer, was on leave in Rome at the time. And it's become even blurrier, ladies and gentlemen. His unit was in the north of Italy. I'm I'm angling the book as if the light's going to make a difference. It kind of does if I bend it around. It's like it's printed a shadow on it. Attached to the US Army. Both agreed to lend their services under Alberto's supervision. The three men called on Maria at nine o'clock in the morning. And truth be told, this is what the Lady Killers was later based on. On the day that she was due to die. She was still in bed when the doorbell rang. She got up, slipped on a thin dress as a substitute for the negligee, not really expecting any professional clients so early in the day, and admitted the callers who were unknown to her. They... Three men called in. How did they know this? The three men called on Maria at nine o'clock, who's the dead lady, bear in mind, On the day that she was due to die, she was still in bed when the doorbell rang. She got up, slipped on a thin dress as a substitute for a negligee, not really expecting professional clients so early in the day and admitted the callers who were unknown to her. They said they had news of Count Seratina, Seratani. She served drinks and in a mood of hospitality, perhaps anticipating business, began to play the piano. Imagine that. You think, oh, I'm going to go here, see this brass, get me dick sucked. You know, fucking fantastic. What a morning, right? Me and me boys... We're all going to go at nine o'clock in the morning to get our dicks licked by Maria the Prozzi, right? And then she starts playing the piano, starts playing the entertainer. Just, just the idea, mate, of just fucking... Just playing chopsticks on the piano. And you're like, oh, yeah, baby. Yes, baby! You know what I mean? Like, fucking... Just being like, we're looking at each other, like... When do we get our dicks out here? What's going on? Why do we have to... Do we pay for this? Why are we paying for this? Why don't we just go to that one that hangs out under that bridge near the fucking industrial estate? She'll do it for a tenner. She'll do it for free if we say we're going to film her and make her a star. Do you know what I mean? It's fucking... just seems odd to me. That was the moment when Luigi took out the hunting knife and stabbed her nine times in the back. <laughs> what a twist! That was the moment. I didn't read that with the reverence it was needed at all. That was the moment when Luigi took out the hunting knife and stabbed her nine times in the back. 
while Renato went into the bedroom to pocket the contents of the jewel case. When arrested by the police in due course, all three men openly admitted their parts in the crime, as did Fantasia when he was interrogated, and this in itself was sufficient to arouse the suspicion of the press. For, criminal, crim, criminal, for criminals seldom admit guilt and liability unless it's under as a cover for some other unexposed activity. Were they stealing her organs, perhaps? In court, Luigi and Renata both confessed to the actual killing, and it was established that both were young men with an excellent family background and no previous record of crime. Alberto, the sharp friend of Fantasia, admitted to organising the murder and theft, although he protested that the original plan had only been robbery. Murder hadn't really been on the agenda. So maybe fucking Luigi went mental. Maybe Luigi's a bit tapped from his time in the army. He's just come out of World War Two, remember? And if he was somehow attached to the US Army, then he's possibly seen both sides of the war, been fighting on both sides, Axis and Allies, and maybe his head's just fucking frazzled by that. Because that must wreck your head, that. If you're like, yeah, I'm going to fight alongside the Nazis, mate. Oh, now I'm going to fight with the Americans against the people that I thought were my friends for three years. And now I don't really know what to believe, because now the Mafia are trying to kill everyone here as well. Oh, God, what do I do now? Do you know what I mean? That must fuck with your head, and that's why you end up killing prostitutes with a hunting knife. In any case, he had been cheated, he claimed. The stolen jewels had not been br- had not brought back more than £100 in the receiver market, right? We've now changed currency. The stolen jewels had not brought more than £100 in the receiver market, about one-tenth of their real value, probably because they've been stolen from a count's prostitute. Um, This was no use whatsoever. So far as he was concerned, he needed the equivalent of £1,000 to pay off Rossi. He stated, in fact, that he had given the poultry £100 to Luigi and Renato as a fee for their trouble. If the police were satisfied with this story, the press wasn't. Journalists did their own investigation and one newspaper reported that a newspaper, uh, sorry, that a neighbour had heard Maria cry out for pardon on the fatal morning of the murder. I'm going to stab you nine times. Pardon? You what? Makes this fucking, this is ridiculous. Other newspapers would not accept that two young men of impeccable record and background could so easily for motives of petty robbery and all that to assist a shabby and shifty character like Fantasia allow themselves, oh the text has gone normal, allow themselves to become so easily and voluntarily involved in a brutal murder. And silly questions were asked. Why nine stabbings when one would have been sufficient? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. What could a slight and helpless girl have done to trigger off such a vicious attack used the teeth? And the $64,000 question, what was the real motive behind the murder? Why the $64,000 question? When any professional criminal would have known that Maria's modest and pathetic collection of jewellery wouldn't have brought much in the way of money in the frugal receiver market. The newspapers rightly posed the questions, but the answers weren't that forthcoming. The trial, set down for July, was awaited with impatient interest and curiosity. Everybody felt that there was more behind the scenes than there had been released to the public. And then, by a strange coincidence, almost a day before the start of the trial, the judge appointed to try the case was locked down, sorry, was knocked down by a car in Rome and was taken to hospital. It seems odd, looking back, that another judge didn't get appointed and that the Ministry of Justice saw fit to postpone the trial until the judge had gotten better, rather than to find a substitute. The net result of this curious delay in action was that the trial was put back for another six months. In the intervening period, the newspapers investigated the various people involved in the case with a kind of dedicated enthusiasm. Journalists dug up a mass of background information and some of it turned out to be quite strange and possibly significant material. Take the killer himself, for instance, Luigi Tyrone. During the German occupation of Rome in 1943 to 1944, he had started as a member of the underground resistance movement, but later had changed his allegiance to become a collaborationist and a Nazi informer. He was therefore a natural natural target for the anti-fascist and anti-Nazi factions, which gained ascendancy after the surrender of Italy. Yet... Although he was denounced as a Nazi sympathiser after the liberation of Rome, no action was taken by authority. By this time, Luigi was posing as a partisan again, and was apparently accepted at face value, so much so that he would soon obtain a commission as an officer in the Italian Liberation Army, which was controlled by the Committee of National Liberation and the United States Fifth Army. 
Luigi's behaviour in action was so bad that he was court-martialed for cowardice and acquitted. His colonel protested to the Minister of War against the acquittal, but the protest was ignored. It was beginning to look as though Luigi had influential friends in very high places. Other odd incidents came to light. Luigi Tyrone's dossier vanished from the filing cabinet at the Ministry of Justice shortly after his arrest for the murder of Maria. Uh, is this that the murder of Maria? And, and it was discovered that while in custody awaiting trial, he had been allowed to spend two days at home with his family in civilian clothes and without guard or escort. This had happened during his transfer from one prison to another. The press, sensing subtler manoeuvrings and mysteries behind the scenes, began to dig deeper and deeper and to shed any polite retentions where important political figures were involved. I don't know what that sentence meant after deeper. <gasps> to shed any polite reticence. Reti since they do journalists found themselves on the fringe of scandal they discovered and announced in print that luigi tyrone's uncle was none other than signor spattero under secretary of state of home affairs and a member of the right-wing christian democrat party his ministry was responsible for state security and the administration of prisons and it looked as if Luigi's two-day unofficial parole to visit his family had been arranged by some very discreet political wire-pulling. The newspapers, particularly the left-wing and communist ones, went gunning for Spatero in a big way, accusing him of corruption and demanding his resignation, but nothing happened, even though the predominantly, predominantly left-wing, sorry, I thought he was going to say predatory, so I'd already prepared for... Predominantly left-wing government might responsibly, might reasonably, fuck me, might reasonably have welcomed the opportunity, it's not even blurry anymore, might have reasonably have welcomed the opportunity to get rid of an embarrassing right-wing minister. Spatero remained in office. It also seemed odd to the press that Luigi, well-connected as he was, should after his two days of unguarded freedom have voluntarily and without apparent pressure returned to jail to await trial for murder when, with the aid of influential friends, he might as well have escaped permanently and perhaps fled the country. On his return to jail, maybe they replaced him with someone else, though, in this time. After consultation with his family and advisers during an unofficial parole, Luigi withdrew his admission of murder. He now said that he had not really killed Maria at all, but was merely covering up for the real murderer who had killed her in order to recover secret documents in her possession. There we go. Needless to say, this pronouncement was received by the press with extreme scepticism, and it merely started a new hair, which the journalists pursued with unflagging energy and enthusiasm. Fucking hell, this one's a long one, isn't it? We've only got three pages. But now we've got some weird asterisks in the middle of the page. Don't know what that means as a, like, as a grammar thing. In an Italy just emerging from the ravages of war and the shadow of many years of totalitarian fascism, uh, the idea of political murder was by no means fanciful, and for many, it must have just seemed way too plausible. New facts emerged and were duly published and commented on in the papers, and generally speaking, they were facts which must have been known already to the police, although they had not been divulged at this stage. For example, it was learned that Maria Laffey had kept a diary, but several pages of it had been torn from it. By whom? And how significant were those pages? Furthermore, Jerry the Bollock was not very good at cunnilingus. As a minister of war for our country, I believe he should pay more attention to the clitoris. You know, things like that. It could just, and then they're like, oh, I don't want people finding this out. Fuck you, though. I don't want my wife finding that out. She thinks I'm good at it. Furthermore, two previous victims of unsolved murders had been friends of Maria. Both had been boarding housekeepers, and in both cases, pages were found to have been torn out of their respective hotel registers when the bodies had been discovered. The police had not been the sorry, the police had been unable to find any logical motive for the murders, not even theft. By drawing a rather strained parallel, some newspapers suggested that the theft of Maria's jewels, which had brought so little reward in the receiver market, might well have been a subterfuge to cover the real reason for the killing. But the real reason for the killing remained an enigma. And no sensible suggestions were put forward. The press operated on the old and well-established principle of asking the questions without being able to provide the answers. It was the question mark approach to journalism, building up a story in which the questions imply the answers, whether they are correct or not, and every minor crawling incident 
oh, sorry, every minor crawling incident which was revealed by turning up a stone became sensational headline material, such as the Cavalier press fashion with stories which appeared to involve political scandal. The next significant event was the discovery of a link, albeit an obscure one, but good for the press headlines between the murdered Maria, Maria Laffey and General Mario Fucking hell. General Mario Roata. It's hard to keep reading in different languages. I'm sure he keeps fucking up the tenses as well. A fascist army officer who disappeared the previous March whilst being tried for treason and murder. The tenuous link was embodied. We've gone blurry again now, the text. It's fucking up with my eyes, man, this. Uh, the tenuous link was embodied in the fact that a previous murder victim, a chauffeur, had frequently been required to drive. This is so hard. An officer who was an aide de camp of General Rowata to Maria's flat for the unusual for the usual services. It's all so blurry, it's like just mashed together, mate. The letters are touching, you're having to break them apart with your eyes. When Rowata disappeared during his trial, he did all the documentary evidence in the case, which was alleged to implicate many top establishment people in Italy, from the king right down to allied officers. The entire business had been well organised and executed, and from the point of view of the press, the speculative possibilities now opened up even more. Could it be that Maria had known something about the General Rowata documentation? Had Rowata been kidnapped and sprinted away and murdered in some part of a royalist plot? And had Maria been eliminated because she was in possession of knowledge or papers which could prove damaging to the conspirators? Finally, had Maria's killers been highly paid to stand the rap for what amounted to political assassination? One final coincidental fact, so we're not getting an answer. One final coincidental fact emerged which seemed to clinch the suggestion of political intrigue and that was the arrest of a nobleman named Max Capuano on charges involving the extortion of money from none other than Signor Rossi. The same Rossi who had been, through his wife, an extortion victim of Alfio Fantasia. It was the previous incident and Fantasia's urgent need for money to repay Rossi which had set in motion the whole mysterious train of events that led to the murder of Maria. Max Capuano, an executive of one of Italy's big chemical concerns, was found on, a, on investigation to have embezzled some 60 million lira from the company and was blackmailing members of the management who were alleged to have sold metallurgical secrets to both the Americans and the Germans. Furthermore, inquiries revealed that among Capuano's associates were Alfio Fantasia, Alberto Galupi, who had originally suggested to Fantasia that he could extract money from Rossi's wife by blackmail, and an unidentified Maria who, it was thought, could have only have been Maria Laffey. One hell of a fucking sentence yet again, Mr. Main. Horrible sentence structure. <sighs> Take a breath. Here, then, was another possibility that Maria had been murdered, not for money, but because she was in possession of papers or evidence implicating Capuano and his colleagues, including Fantasia and Galupi, in international blackmail and even treason. Wherever the truth lay among the tortuous trysts, Fucking hell, that was me. Wherever the truth lay among the tortuous, twisted threads of the case, it seemed certain that the Maria Laffey murder trial would lift the lid on a hotbed of cloak and dagger intrigue involving politics, high finance, it's a very long sentence again, and important people in Italy and other countries. There were too many interwoven strands to permit of any facile explanation, and by this time, the original suggestion that Maria had been murdered for the theft of a mere £100 worth of jewels and the most was the most improbable theory of all. The fucking hell, I couldn't do it. The, the, all, the comment, all the commas in it, just fucking dozens of commas. The world awaited the full denouement with intense interest and an almost greedy anticipation. The trial, when it came, after many proponents, brought the press and the public in Italy and elsewhere down to earth with a disappointing thud. That time, just shitloads of commas after every three words. The case was treated within the original terms of reference as simply the murder of a prostitute for motives of theft, and not one of the related matters which had aroused such exotic speculations in the newspapers were referred to by either the prosecution or the defence. I genuinely didn't understand that sentence. I'm going to read it again. The case was treated within the original terms of reference as simply the murder. Oh, so they ignored all of the investigations. Okay. Luigi Tyrone, presented as a crazy, mixed-up victim of fascist youth, was sentenced to life imprisonment. That seems unfair, then, if they think that. As were Fantasia. And Gull I know he killed a woman by stabbing her nine times in the back while she played piano, but still, if you're going to say, oh, you know, he's 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 been mixed up in this and he, you know, he's been brainwashed and that, put him away for life. Do you know what I mean? It just seems a bit odd. A bit harsh, really. 
Renata Piasanti, the young undergraduate, was sentenced to 30 years imprisonment. Max Capuano, the embezzling businessman who many considered to be the key figure in this baffling intrigue, was fined a modest 3,000 lira and sent to prison for nine years. And that was the end of that. Whatever secrets or conspiracies lay behind the superficial facts of murder, again, we've got no answers. They were never brought to light. All that remains is the smoke of speculation and imaginative guesswork based on unremitting investigation by Italian and foreign journalists. Were they so wide off the mark, as the political judge implied, as the trial judge implied, when he described newspaper hints of political intrigue as a ludicrous hoax? Twenty years have gone by since the trial. If there was ever more to come of the case than the simple surface facts, then people in the know, and there must have been quite a few of them, quite apart from the principals who were jailed, have maintained a discreet silence for a long time. He hasn't really commented on many of them, so he either felt very passionate about that, or he really needed to fill the paragraph up. The next one's called The Odd Prophet, and I'll read that to you next week. I'll be dead honest, I've put another one on me Spotify recently for free with some adverts in. I might do the same with this one. I think it's quite a good one. We've got some Nazis, we've got some conspiracy stuff. It's, it's quite a nice one, isn't it? It's not, you know, it's fun. It's a fun one to read. So I'm going to pop this on Spotify, free for people, but there will be adverts within it. Obviously, it's on Patreon as well, and you get access to all the others on Patreon. Patreon.com slash world around you if you'd like to hear more of these. The next chapter is chapter 24, which means there's another 22 chapters, potentially, that you haven't heard on there. Plus, there's well over 270 bonus podcasts, other bonus series of podcasts. Video versions of the regular episodes. You can read all of my ebooks on there, and you can join for free for seven days at the minute, or you can join the three pounds here and get access to absolutely everything and a couple of discount codes join the higher tiers and i'll send you out a little merch pack each month but if you join the right tier which i think was the eight pound tier but either way thank you for listening i hope you've enjoyed this uh join the patreon to hear more if you're already on the patreon fucking i know it's annoying you hearing me advertising the patreon on here but you know you've got to try and get more of you over innit? how do you think i got you over here do you know what i mean i got to we, we, we need to we need to grow the numbers you know, just, uh, you know, for my own ego, and so I can get a couple of quid, because I have been reading this book now for about a year, and uh, I enjoy it, but I think it's really poorly written, and I want to get on to the next books. The next books we've got is uh, Etiquette for Women, which is a very old book, and I've also got, which I might start reading for free, some form of medical dictionary as well, which seems outdated, so that might be quite good. But we've got to get through this book first, so we've got another, like what, what like four weeks of reading this maybe uh maybe maybe five weeks maybe three weeks come over to patreon and find out i'll see you in a bit